This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. So we're going to go through and introduce the group statement of changes in equity. Uh, and then we'll go through and work an example. Uh, it's a tricky little topic, uh, but it's important you understand it now because when we go through and look at the situation where we have changes in ownership, uh, so I think the chapter is entitled Changes in Group Structure, which comes on a little bit later within the course, uh, that those two tend to get tested together. Okay, So it tests your group statement of change in equity and uh, changes in group structure. So we'll, we'll talk more about the changes in group structure later. So relax. We're just going to focus on the, the group statement of change in equity. Okay, uh, And to do so, you need to understand what a statement of change in equity does. It, it looks at, it's very literal, isn't it? It takes your equity. So share capital, retained earnings, and from a group perspective, the non-controlling interest, and looks at how that has moved, hasn't it? So it takes your opening figure, usually adds on a profit figure, and then maybe deducts a dividend figure. So if you just think about it simply from an individual company perspective, and think about retained earnings, you know, we go through there and take the opening retained earnings, we add on the profit, we deduct the dividend, and then that gives us our closing retained earnings, doesn't it? Does that sound familiar? Yeah, hopefully so. So what we're going to have to do now is going to have to look at things from a, from a group perspective. Uh, and you've got the pro forma there, okay, uh, within the notes. And what you can see there is it goes through and takes the opening balances and looks at the balances, is it at the end, okay? Now, what you need to go through and appreciate there is that when we're looking at the statement of change in equity, it looks at the movement in equity. So when you're looking at your equity, uh, from the group statement of financial position, you have there, don't you? It will be your equity shares and your reserves won't it uh, and then that will go through there you total that up and that's the amount that is attributable to the parent isn't it okay because you've got the equity shares which remember is a hundred percent of the parent and then your reserves are that standard working five aren't they okay hundred percent of the parent plus p share versus post acquisition so that's everything that belongs to the parent in there isn't it to which we then go through and look at the non-controlling interest don't we uh, the non-controlling interest working is normally we refer to it as working for in our standardized workings and then that will go through there and give you the total equity won't it okay there we go so what we're going to look at in the statement of change in equity, we're going to look at the amounts attributable to the parent at the start of the year compared to the end of the year, and also the non-controlling interest figure that you have at the start of the year compared to the end of the year. Okay, so, so that's what you have at the top, isn't it? The amounts attributable to the equity holder of the parent and the non-controlling interest. Okay. Uh, so in order to go through and work those figures out, uh, the balances at the start of the period. Uh, essentially, what you're doing is you are doing for your non-controlling interest a, a standard working for, aren't we? So if you think about your, your non-controlling interest and how we go through and calculate that, you know, your non-controlling interest, you take your non-controlling interest at the date of acquisition, don't we? To which we add on the non-controlling interest share of S's post acquisition, don't we? Okay. And again, the net assets or the, the NCI acquisition can either be based on the fair value or the proportionate share of net assets. Uh, again, the post acquisition figure you just need to be a bit careful of, don't we? Because that's the post acquisition figure up to the start of this year, isn't it? Not the the end of the year. So what we could do there is that figure 
is the NCI at the start of the move. Okay, so that potentially would be that figure there, wouldn't it? Okay, so it's it's nothing new necessarily, is it? Because we already know how to calculate NCI. It's just being able to think about that NCI calculation at a different period in time. Normally, we work it out at the end of the year here. We're just doing it at the start of the year, aren't we? Okay. Uh, the other figure that we're going to go through and just briefly mention, again, these are quite tough. There are easy ones at the moment, is looking at the balance at the start of the year attributable to the equity holders of the parent. So, again, what we're looking at there, we're, we're thinking essentially of like a, a working number five. Uh, we're looking at the amount attributable to the parent. So what we're going to go through and do that again, we're going to go through and look at a hundred percent of the parents. So a hundred percent of the equity attributable to the parent. Uh, again, just be careful. That's going to be, isn't it? At the start of the year, to which we then add on, is it P share of any post acquisition profits? Okay, then again, that post acquisition profits looks at the movement from the date of acquisition retained earnings to the retained earnings at the start of this year. Okay, uh, so that will go through that and give us the figure, which is the opening figure. Okay. Everybody happy with that? Again, it's the same workings. So that's like a working five. The NCI is like a working four, but we're just doing it at a different period in time. Okay. Uh, the other bits that we've got are then looking at the total comprehensive income for the year attributable then to the parent and the non-controlling interest. So remember that that's the linkage, isn't it, between the opening position and the closing position within your equity is everything that comes from the statement of profit or loss, isn't it? So, you know, if you go through that and uh, look at your statement of profit or loss. So just a little extract. Remember what we have there at the bottom is remember your profit for the year, isn't it? So remember that's your profit for the year of the group, which is essentially 100% of P, isn't it? And 100% of S. Let's not worry about any adjustments. Let's just understand the concepts and the fundamentals. Uh, and then what we went through and did there, didn't we, is that we went through there and split that into the amounts that are attributable to parent and the non-controlling interest wasn't it uh, the amount attributable to the parent was a balancing figure and the non-controlling interest was the non-controlling interest percentage multiplied by s's profit for the year wasn't it so that's what we looked at in that previous chapter wasn't it everything to do with profit or loss and what's going to happen now is that these two figures here, where do they go? Well, they go to your group statement of changes in equity, okay? Uh, and they get added on, don't they, to the opening figures, okay? So you've got the, the amount attributable to the parent and the amount attributable to the non-controlling interest, okay? Uh, so a bit easier, if you like, than, than looking at the balances for the equity and the non-controlling interest at the start of the year. I think you'll agree. Uh, what you've then got is the dividends at the bottom are just, I think, that little bit easier. Uh, the dividend, if the parent pays a dividend, well, you just put in 100% of the parent's dividend, don't we? Because if you've got the parent and the subsidiary, if the parent pays a dividend, all of it goes outside of the group, doesn't it? However, if you've got a parent and a subsidiary and, and the little old subsidiary uh, pays a dividend and some of it belongs in the group, so the parent gets its share, doesn't it? But the non-controlling interests sit outside of the group and they get their share of that subsidiary dividend, don't they? So that there 
is a non-controlling interest share of S's dividend. Okay, so it's normally quite a straightforward figure to go through and get, provided that you've remembered how to calculate it. Okay, uh, how do you get the balance at the close? Total down each of the columns. Okay, uh, questions usually ask you to work out the balance at the start uh, and aren't too concerned with working out the balance at the close anyway. Okay, uh, so there you go. What I do is before you have a look at the question, which we'll debrief in the next video, uh, go through, rework the notes, make sure you're happy with everything. Rewatch this video if you like, uh, before you then look at the actual question. Because uh, the question's quite tricky and it's important to know that you understand the fundamentals before we actually start looking at the question. Other than that, see you in a little while. Enjoy.